We'll continue this week on Locked On Utah Hockey Club. We're going to talk back to the players. Get to know your team. Get to know this Utah Hockey Club team. We're talking John Marino and what his role might look like on the Utah Blue Line all on today's episode. So be sure to stay locked in. You are Locked On Utah Hockey Club. Your daily podcast on the Utah Hockey Club, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to the show, everybody. This is Locked On Utah Hockey Club, your number one daily podcast on the Utah Hockey Club. I'm your host, Robin Leonio, alongside Tom Callahan. We want to thank everyone for making this show your first listen every single day. We are free and available everywhere you get your shows. We got a good show on today, Tom. It is uh, the last day of July for everyone listening. It's can't believe that we're already, you know, now past seven months in. It's absolutely crazy. Uh, as we're getting closer and closer to the 2024 NHL season to uh, begin, training camp is literally just around the corner now, Tom. So we still have a lot of players to get to, a lot of get to know your team segments. So these, so a lot of these Utah fans get to know who's on their team and what kind of role they're going to be playing. And today, no exception with the new, with one of the new guys in John Marino. You know, I I think Robin that we a lot of the attention went to, to Sergachev, right? And the Sergachev deal, that's the flashy one, that's the sexy one. Hey, big name, big numbers coming over. Right. Uh, so I think that that deal got so much attention. But John Marino didn't get as much attention, but I think it's going to be just about as important to this Utah blue line. So I'm glad that we're going to get a chance to talk a little bit about him, his game, his evolution, uh, and then, you know, the different uh, spots I think you're going to see him uh, in this Utah lineup. You know, really is interesting. Like the more that that offseason, that, you know, the that draft weekend went by when the Sergeyev trade hit and the Marino trade hit, we started to really get a good idea on you know, what kind of blue line Bill Armstrong was looking for to for uh, to start this Utah Hockey Club team um, for their first season uh, in Salt Lake City come this fall. Uh, and the, again, getting two guys who can easily fill up the 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 the, the that top four. And again, we'll kind of get dive more into about that and our thoughts about all that. But it uh, it certainly is a nice ad and some something that I mean, I'm excited to see what Marino can do. Well, and Robin, think about where we were, what, a little over a month ago. No defensemen. Mm -hmm. Question marks everywhere. What is going to happen? Are they going to go defense, defense, defense at the draft? Is it going to take them a while to build? No, they went the opposite. They, they went forward heavy in the first round, which is fine. I think they made some great picks. Yeah. But then brought in established NHL blue liners in Sergachev, in Marino, in Cole, um, which, to be honest with you, to me, accelerated their timeline a little bit more than had they drafted their defensive depth, which, they, I mean, they obviously did pick some defensemen in the draft. It's not like they went all forwards. But to draft and develop those players, that's a couple of years, you know, minimum, in a mm -hmm. cycle. This way, what Utah did is they accelerated their timeline for success by a couple of seasons, in my opinion, by getting some NHL quality defensemen on the roster right now, still making some good picks and starting to really, I think, um, and even to the point where, uh, but before I go to the point I was just going to make, I, I want to say they actually showed some restraint by not going crazy, by not throwing, you know, the the farm at everybody in free agency because they really could have spent all the way to the cap if they wanted to. Didn't, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that that was actually one of the things that that was nice. They showed some restraint. And because of that, uh, that's another reason why people who might be saying, well, they made these trades, they're win now. They're not win now. Um, they, they still have cap space. They're comfortable where they are. They have a young and a growing roster that is going to improve. And this is slow but steady acceleration. It's not mash your foot on the gas. Here we go. We better go to the top of the next year. That's not where they're at. So they're growing it. They're putting the right pieces in place, or at least so we hope. 
uh, and to be able to make this roster stronger as they go. So number one, kudos uh, to Bill Armstrong, I think, for doing things in a slow but steady pace. Like this is definitely the tortoise right here. You know, this is not the hare. This is the tortoise. But what we learned from that story was slow but steady wins the race. And so that is what we're building towards right now. So I'm, I'm pretty pleased to see that. And, and when we're going to talk about Marino here, a guy that, he didn't have Utah on his radar of teams he thought he might go to. I don't think Utah fans had Marino as a player coming to Utah, but yet when you step back and look at the deal, I think it makes a lot of sense. And being traded, you know, being traded over from it was really mainly mainly draft picks. Like Utah didn't have to give up much for the Marino deal. The the Sergachev deal. I mean, you can make other arguments for and you know what exactly they, they gave up for that. But the Marino deal, uh, you know, for you know, for most purposes, from a, from our perspective, Tom, from my perspective, it seemed like okay, that seemed to be the smart move to make. Yeah, and we talked prior to the draft and prior to free agency about weaponizing that cap space, being able to take on players that other teams just simply couldn't afford to hold on to, and teams do they get up against that bump, and they have to start dealing guys. Tampa's done it. We've watched Chicago do it. We're watching other teams do it. Uh, you know, the Leafs are are there. Or if they don't deal guys, a la the Colorado Avalanche, they really have to do some gymnastics to make guys fit. And that is also something that's going to handicap your team in the long run. Now, everybody hands out a bad contract here and there, and you're going to overpay a guy here and there. But it's interesting to me that... So I'm going to look at Tampa Bay just because that's how Sergachev ended up coming over to Utah. They were opportunistic. They knew Tampa Bay kind of figured they were going to lose Stamkos. He ends up going to Nashville. Then you have the chance of bringing in Jake Gensel. You still need to clear the decks for the money because you're paying so many other guys so much money. They have to figure out a way to do it. And the way to do it was to clear Sergachev out, who really, I mean, could have a question mark on him with, coming off the injury, right? That if you're going to look at a guy and say, ah, we could have some doubt, Sergachev's the guy. But if he comes back and he's 100% healthy in his mid-20s with team control at what I think is a good value contract for his upside, Utah absolutely just stole him. Uh, despite the return, and I, I respect the players you give up in return, but you have the cap space. And with Marino, you're not even giving up NHL roster players, you're giving up, you know, I guess intangibles at that point, because how much do you trust your scouting staff? How much do you trust your player development guys? They all have to play an impact in this too. And I think Utah feels pretty comfortable in their front office, actually, with all aspects of that. And so they're willing to roll the dice on themselves. Yeah, you know, and absolutely. And I feel like that also just shows the confidence that um, that is in the, uh, not just the, not just general manager, Bill Armstrong, but yeah, and the entire scouting staff and taking a look at, all right, we know that, uh, we feel confident that, okay, we don't need these two extra picks. Um, this is a good, you know, this is a good take to get on, um, you know, for now. And we'll worry about the draft later because we'll, you know, they've been smart with utilizing their draft picks, uh, you know, for the entire of this Bill Armstrong era, there's not there have been very few picks who I've scratched my head and I'm like, all right, I don't know where the hell is going on. This. <laughs> and there are some teams where you do that a lot, aren't there? Oh, there are uh, there are a number of teams who uh, just have hop been online. You'll see the fan bases; they're not shy. Oh yeah, if you go on any of the Reddit threads of any of those teams, <laughs> that's a. Uh, that's that. That's a lot, that. That's something you'd love to dig yourself through uh, at some point. It's pretty fun. Um, anyways, we're talking John Marino. I'm talking about the kind of role he's going to play for Utah on the blue line, and uh, maybe see what we could do down the road for Utah if he decides to stick around for a little bit longer. We'll do that right after this. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball which makes getting tickets easier and faster. Prices on the game tab usually go down the closer it gets to first pitch, with killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seats, and their lowest price guarantee. 
Game time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. I know one thing's for sure. I always love to go to Diamondbacks, Giants games. The uh, The atmosphere at Chase Field here in the Phoenix area has always been really fun. Um, there's always really good deals. I always find the, some of the best deals for those games. With those last-minute deals, once again, flash deals, zone deals, I can see my view from the seat in the venue before you even purchase it. I can see a little, it's like a little uh, rendering of where it might look like. The lowest price guarantee, event cash protection, job loss protection, and more. Of course, my favorite all-in pricing. Toggle this feature and show up the total up front with no surprise fees at checkout. Take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N N H L for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So, real quick, Tom, let's take a look at. John Marino's last season stats with the New Jersey Devils. I'm um, seeing how we, you know, how he fared. 75 games played, so almost a full season. Four goals, 21 assists, 25 points, and the minus six. Yeah, the the dash six. Honestly, last year New Jersey was a disappointment. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the Devils would be the first ones to tell you that. It's interesting. Also, last year Marino. Uh, pretty much doubled what he's ever taken in a season in PIMS, which, I mean, maybe you start to kind of look at, is that symptomatic of something else? Uh, all of his helpers are even strength. You know, all of his goals are even strength. So he's a five-on-five guy, two-way guy. He's starting to show, uh, coming out of, of Harvard with Pittsburgh and now New Jersey, a bit of an offensive upside. TOI last year, just shy of 21 minutes, so he's a horse. He can take a lot of time. 89 blocks, uh, 39 hits. What I would like to see in those numbers is probably those coming up a little bit more. But here's the interesting thing, too, and and I mean, we talk about this once we get into his potential pairing coming up here, um, is the balance in his game. If he has the ability to jump up and go, if you're going to pair him with a Sergachev, how much do you want to temper that part of it to say, look, Sergachev's probably the guy who's going to take off a lot. And I'm not saying this is a set in stone pair, but I'm just kind of, you know, spitballing here. You look at his numbers, he can get involved right. in the play, but he's not a power play guy. Could be right hand shot. I mean, if you put him on a PP2, what would you get out of him? It really depends how well he's going to move the puck and distribute there. I don't think, you know, he's the. He's not the OV on the off wing for the one timer type of guy. So I think to me, his value is in the five on five. I was kind of digging into a little bit of his um, his extra stats. Um, the course, he's OK. The Fenwick is OK. And, and I don't get too far into the weeds on these. I think they're helpful, but I don't think they're everything. Uh, as we have talked about, we are both eyeball test people. We like to see someone play. Uh huh and watch them go through their paces. But, um, you know, it's kind of hard to say that I think he's... I'd like to see him bring pretty much the all-around numbers up with Utah now and become a leader on this defensive core because this is coming into now a sixth NHL season, and he is starting to grow. If he's putting on... He could use a little bit more strength, I think, a little bit more meat and muscle... If he has that, if he's durable enough, he's missed a couple games here and there, bumps and bruises along the way. Um, if he can up all of that for me and take essentially what is an incremental step in his development, then I think that's a really good decision, uh, bringing him in. He's 27, so we like to talk about defensemen. I, I talk about players peaking when they're 27. I think defensemen can peak a little older, so I think you're skewing right into the prime here for Marino and kind of entering you know, that. Yeah, right. And hopefully that is exactly where we see this landing right now. You know, that's one thing, the good, good thing to keep in mind too, all that, that he's, you know, with, you know, with that age, plus the other thing too. And, uh, and, you know, kind of something that you mentioned on is that he isn't your puck moving offensive defenseman. Um, and I think that's kind of the things that the, needs to be discussed because you're not going to have you're not, like 
if you have all puck moving offensive defensemen on your team, you're not gonna you're not gonna have a really good, you know, easily to go they're the ones who are willing to be that last line, fall back back, have an insane back check, someone's willing willing to get in that area. That's kind of what I imagining John Marino to be, right? To kind of fall back if we need to, kind of to be that, you know, that's that classic stay at home defenseman. You need kind of one you need someone like that when you have a those like your Sergachev who's a little bit more forward, you know, offensively minded, or your Dersey who's a little more offensively minded. Exactly. Exactly. And so the flip side of those coins, Marino, uh, and again, Cole, I don't know. I, I feel like Cole's a five six guy. Um, but maybe he can give you some second team PK minutes, which is where you'd like to see Marino give you first team PK minutes, mm-hmm. right? Work hard, work hard on the shorthanded side of things, be valuable defensively. And you've got Valamaki and Kessel ring and, uh, you know, those guys will be there, but they're 24 and 25. Here's the other thing. I kind of a little surprised when I see this Jersey's only 25 years old, that, that just right. feels surprising to me. Um, but you know what Marino is? actually the second oldest defenseman uh, on this team besides Ian Cole's 35 as of right now, Marino's 27. And I mean, circuit chef, 26, Jersey, 25, Valamaki, 25, Kessel ring, 24. Um, guess what? <laughs> you know, he's also going to have to be a, a bit of a leader there, both on and off the ice with the experience. Now he took a little longer route to the NHL. He did go through college, played at Harvard, and really was unheralded for the most part, but made a really good jump to the NHL and I think was impressive in that measure. So, you know, maybe is, you know, coming on a little bit late as far as the, you know, didn't bloom at 18. And that's a good thing. You know, he's he's coming into his own in his late 20s here just in time for Utah to reap the benefits. And, you know, I think uh, sometimes those are the kind of the best ones that kind of like they – bloom a little bit later you're realizing you know you're realizing the potential and really showing what they're capable of there's so many players out there who it takes until let's say they uh they get drafted and they spend all four years in college because they're still not seasoned enough so they didn't sign their deal and then they do but they, even then they still spend the first couple of years and um in the minors you see a lot of that happen and eventually coming a few years later like oh whoa where did this guy come from take a look at where 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 was he drafted when was he drafted uh he was actually drafted by edmonton number six in 2015 or in the sixth round i should say sixth round 2015 154 overall so a pretty deep guy that I'm yeah. look uh, there's not a lot of six rounders that make it no it's very yeah those 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 later ones they t- like they either take forever or like they become they become gems we've talked about six seventh you know seventh rounders who you know end up becoming these jewels and part of a team you know massive part of a team and I'm, and again i'm not putting that kind of pressure on on marine i'm like oh he's a sick because you don't want that, right? That, like, that's 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 the that's an outlier, but there right. still is that level of okay, like he's he's blooming and we're still in exp- and he seems like he's finally coming into his own. And again, again, as you mentioned, at, at around that age where a defenseman normally enters their prime, it is something to look for. And one of the things that is great about Marino that will carry him to continue to develop all the other aspects of his game is his skating. He's a strong skater. uh, And I think that that really adds a ton of value. If you were going to ask me, I don't know why you would, but if you were going to ask me, Tom, I, uh, my kid, you know, wants to be an NHL player. What is the number one thing they should work on? Is it their shot? Is it their physical strength? Um, You know, the, should I put them in like, you know, the, the, hockey like the mental game and learning all the x's and o's and all that stuff and i say no skating far and away skating if you it's unbelievable how even the quote-unquote worst skaters in the nhl are still amazing on their feet because you have to be you have to be agile you have to be quick but when we look at someone and probably my favorite 
example uh, is uh, Makar with the Avalanche. He is magic. He dances on his skates. His edge work is outstanding. Inside, outside, his ability to shift direction, maintaining body control, and the puck with him. It's just, he makes plays no one else can make because he mm-hmm. is probably one of the best skaters I've ever seen. And, and so, you know, when, when, when someone like him and, you know, emerged and became, it came well known, that's what was talked about across, across MIDI is look at his skating. He's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Like just, uh, and that is, that's raw talent. Okay. Mm-hmm. You can develop your skating, but man, that's huge. But so my point is with Marino to go back to that is that the fact that he is a good, solid skater, I think will carry a lot of other areas in his game. And if he continues to refine those things, and as I mentioned, I mean, you know, I always like to see guys who are, and so does Bill Armstrong, like to see guys who are big and strong. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, he's six one and, and usable strength. I don't care what you can bench press. Can you push off a guy in the corner? Can you pin a guy? Can you use, do you have usable strength? Let's go back to that conversation uh, with, with Craig Morgan at the beginning of the month. Right. When talking about we're no longer the big, you know, the big pylons, you're talking about these really big dudes. Yeah, sure. But they have the, they they could skate. They have they have the strength on the ice and like in the word that you used, usable strength. And they're really physical and not afraid to use that body to their advantage. Yeah. And that's that's what I imagine Marino continuing to grow into here with the Utah hockey club. So uh, I know we're going to talk about where all that slots in and uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to that too, but I really think he's a guy who now coming here, here's the other thing too. All right, this is your third team really four if you count Edmonton drafting you, but your third team that you played for in the NHL. Now's your chance to really develop your reputation into something special uh, because you've been around teams have kept you around. And again, I mean, you know, Pittsburgh was good, uh, but struggled a little bit here in later years. New Jersey was good until last year, disappointment. Um, But now you're coming to a club that is on the upswing. And can you be one of the guys who leads Utah hockey club forward and into the playoffs? It's a big opportunity. It really is. And we'll, and and, and we'll wrap up our thoughts, kind of talk about all that and, And uh, where this all is leading in our thoughts right after this. So now let's talk impact both now and a little bit down the road, Tom. Um, How do you foresee John Marino's impact going into into this season? So your right-hand shot defenseman, are Jersey, Marino, and Kesselring. Now, yes, guys can play their off wing, I am aware. However, typically that's not what you look to do. So now what you're trying to figure out is who goes on the left side. If you have... I I don't think you want a defensive pairing that is Jersey and Sergachev. I just think that that's too much of the same thing on the same pair. And it could result in some spectacular goals and some incredible like three on O odd man rushes because they both decided to jump. Um, you know, so I don't think that that's your pair. I think that Marino makes sense with a Sergachev uh, on the left side because he does have that two way stability. And again, this is what I talk about uh, back in the first segment when I was, you know, talking about not only the two way, but also he's got offensive flash knows when to jump. I think, his numbers would actually get better as a compliment to Sergachev. I think you would actually see more offensive output because of him playing with them. And as a pair with the top scoring line, I think those guys could do a lot of damage. I think that'd be really interesting for me. I'd love to see that, quite frankly. Honestly, I mean, I would too. And you know, it really amazes me. And um, we've talked about this before, where... A lot of other projections are like, oh, have Sergachev and Dursey on the same line, on that top line. In theory, sounds awesome. But in practice, that just won't work. Because you're talking about two guys who are willing to, who, who are more offensively minded. What's going to happen 
when uh, it, it's going to happen at some point because it's it, it, we're talking 82 games and in 60 minute games a, a a turnover in the zone and you got to jump back really quickly and if you are a defenseman who's jumping up kind of like into that slot or into the you know a little bit deeper into the offensive zone you might cut a little off guard and all of a sudden oh there we go odd man rush situation well, and there's there's no accounting for chemistry either, right? You can right. try these guys all together and just see what fits, what what mix works. You never know. Something could surprise you. But that's why – and this is – believe me, again, we've talked about this on several shows. Training camp is so important for Utah this year. Oh, yeah. Because so much has changed defensively. They have a lot to figure out. And – I mean, even before they play the first preseason game, I, the what I would be watching the most in camp are the those deep pairings. Oh yeah, like I'm not too worried about the about those forward lines. The forward lines I know very well. Like not not that I'm like 100 percent confident, but I'm I'm fairly confident. I can kind of know where most of those players are going to slot up because they most of the forwards have been together with a couple of new guys. With the defense, as you just mentioned. It's a completely new blue line. And again, there's still a couple of returning guys. Jersey's coming back. Castle Ring's coming back. Bellamock is coming back. That's half, your, that's half your blue line, but the other half, all new people. Like, And they're all going to be on different different pairs. Yeah, and that's that's why you hope, I think, a Sergeyev Marino pair just evolves. You know, and they come out and they play well together. I think, and one thing that is nice about having a veteran like Cole is I think he is smart enough. He's been around long enough that he'll figure out how to adapt to whoever he plays with. Mm -hmm. So I'm not worried about him, but you have to then figure out the mix of the other three guys around too. And again, I'd, I'd be shocked if Cole was still getting big minutes. I know we did a big breakdown on him when we talked about him a little bit earlier on, but I think Marino's got to be a guy who does continue to munch at a 21 uh, minute per night rate. And yep. to me, he's also got to be a big penalty killing guy. I want to see him out there and I want to see him blogging shots. I want to see him playing physical. I want to see him winning those battles in the corner and on the wall uh, and getting those pucks down the ice. Like that to me is an important role for him to also be able to play. That's going to be a big one, Robin. So to hey, me, that that's it. PK one is, is my number one little bullet for him. PK one. And then like, I mean, I guess the exact pairing, you can't really say, but top four at the very least. Uh, oh, no doubt. Top four. If yeah. he's not in the top four, they messed up. You so, wouldn't, yeah. you wouldn't, you wouldn't trade for that guy. If he's not in your top four, he's got to be top four. And I'm on your I right really side, either, I, either first pair or second pair. One or and the it, other. And it really depends, too. Here's the other thing. You do have to make room for Jersey to take yet another step forward this year, which mm -hmm. you hope he does. But again, you don't want two offensive defensemen on the same pair. Um, you're a Sharks guy. You you know, I mean, you... you do you, Oh, you don't want me to bring it up? There's uh, only I, one puck. What happened when they brought in Eric Carlson? How did that go? The, the, the Carlson Burns experiment was one of the <laughs> worst things that's ever happened to that team. <laughs> oh I, 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 I much I loved it. I have an Eric Carlson jersey, but like it's <laughs> a supremely talented player. Yeah, but there's only one puck. And I think if I recall, like Burns and Carlson are both right hand shots. So that also didn't help. But I'm gonna take, take a look at this. The moment. Here's here, here's something to keep in mind. I think it's almost the moment that Brett Burns left the Sharks. Carlson took a huge step up. Mm -hmm. Like oh. and Burns went to Carolina and got better. Yeah, exactly. It's like they weren't meant to be together. It's like either one or the other. It sound, like I said, it sounded great in theory having two offensive defensemen on the top on a top pair. It just did not work in practice. So I am telling you, Utah fans, from experience. You're not gonna have to do. We're not. We're. They're, you're not gonna make that same mistake. Yeah, don't do that. Please don't do that. But yes, I just, Robin. I wanted to give you a chance to voice your <laughs> your opinion on that. Oh, it's God. funny because as soon as I went there, I saw your your head down. You're like, oh, why do you have to bring this up? I I kid because I care. Yeah. But 
but but you of all people could talk about that at length and i think that that's you know that's valuable insight though you you have to learn what not to do so yeah and that's why you know you know that's why we do what we do right we're taking a look and we follow all the teams of course you know mm-hmm. i grew up watching one team specifically and then I, all of a sudden became a hockey reporter and here i am now um and the same thing for you you've been around the block you know former nhl play-by-play guy doing an else radio ahl play-by-play you've been all around you've been you know how it all you know how this all works from several different organizational viewpoints i think yeah. in my my pro career i've been a part of eight different nhl affiliations so i've seen a lot of different ways organizations do things it's pretty interesting everybody's so different it really is any final thoughts before we close things off? No, I think uh, Marino's an exciting player. And I think that Utah uh, hockey club fans, uh, look, he's he's not the guy getting the attention, right? I mean, on defense, it is. Everybody's going to be excited about Sergachev. So what I'm telling you is don't worry. You'll get enough of Sergachev figuring out who he is, what he is. But pay attention to Marino. Uh, if you're going to be a fan at camp, watch him. You know, pay attention to what he does, how he does it. The other thing to watch, too, and I'm sure we'll talk about him eventually, too, is the leadership that Cole provides. As I pointed out, Marino's the second oldest defenseman. He's got to step into that role now, too, and can provide valuable leadership there for the defensive core, uh, you know, around some of the younger guys. And uh, that's another thing I, I look to see from him as well. So can could be an incredibly valuable pickup. It could very well be, and we'll definitely keep an eye out. And um, we'll... Like, We'll, we'll keep an eye out through training camp, through preseason, through the beginning of the, in the season. See how see how he looks, see how he how comfortable he feels uh, with his new team, with the Utah Hockey Club. But that's going to be it for today's episode of the Locked On and Utah Hockey Club podcast. If you like what you heard, don't forget to leave a review, to like, comment, and subscribe if you have yet to already. We're available everywhere you get your podcast, including on YouTube, Sirius XM, and ad free on Amazon Music. If you're an Amazon Prime subscriber, don't forget to interact with us also on social media. We are on the app formerly known as Twitter, now called X on threads and Instagram at LO underscore NHL Utah. I'm personally at Robin underscore Leonio and Tom Callahan is at Callahan on air. Don't forget to also join our insider text club. Text in to 801-760-9033. That's 801 801- 760-9033 to get started or click the link in the description. I'll have the link on available on all the platforms you guys are listening to. Um, and you, you just, you will be able to sign up, get all the info and we'll get you some exclusive content, ability to text us one-on-one anytime you guys want and ask us mailbag questions when we, when we put out the call out for those so many different perks you guys get for being a part of our text club. So don't forget to join. But once again, thanks for do all for joining us on today's episode and we'll see you guys next time.